Good morning and a very warm welcome to Heartlands here in Midlands 103 with me, the Reverend Nigel Gill. And folks, today I have the President of the Methodist Church, the Reverend David Turtle, going and sharing his story with us. He was here with us a few weeks back and I took the liberty of asking him to share his personal journey with us. As we listen to this, you are going to hear our pet cockatoo creating a little bit and also you're going to hear Peter crowing which is very fitting considering that we are just past Easter and as you all know when Peter denied Jesus the cock crew three times and well there's a cockerel around here and he creates all of the time and so you will hear him in the background as well and hence that's the reason why I called him Peter however as you all know folks I go and ask people three questions, and the three questions I put to David, who is the president of the Methodist Church, are, what was life like before you came to Christ? What were the circumstances that brought you to Christ? And then, what has life like been since? And in regard to him, of course, we'll be delving into the very fact that he has now become president of the Methodist Church. So, with no further ado, Reverend David, it's wonderful to have you with us, and we are thankful that you are sharing your story. The first question, as I've said, is, what was life like before you came to Christ? Well, thanks, Nigel, for the opportunity to be here. It's uh, it's good to be able to, to share with you and with the listeners. I grew up in a little place in County Tyrone called Stewartstown. I grew up in a family where we were brought along to, to church in the local Methodist church in the mornings, brought along to, to different meetings in the afternoon and brought along to a mission hall in the evening. So I was well immersed in church. We were part of a, a farming family. My my father had a mixed farm with dairy and beef. I had two sisters, two older sisters, and I suppose there was always an expectation that I would come along and be farming along with my father. And that was something that was no problem to me because I really loved that lifestyle. As I grew up, I was involved in the farm again and again. And so that was something that was really core to to life as well as being involved in different church activities but as i suppose is true for many people the the fact that i was brought along to church and brought along to all of these different christian activities didn't actually change or transform my life in and of itself and although as a child I think I probably prayed many prayers asking Jesus to come into my heart because that's what it seemed was expected of me it was actually whenever I was 15 years of age that I actually came to the point of giving my life to Christ and there were a number of things that led up to that I had been involved with the Christian Endeavour in Dungannon Methodist Church I attended there because whenever you're the the youngest in the house and you've got older sisters who can drive, you tend to go where they're able to bring you. So I was involved there and went along, but really was impressed by some of the the, the people who were involved in leading that, impressed by the way they were living their lives and uh, actually, I suppose, started to be convicted for the first time that actually I needed to give my life personally to Jesus. One evening when I remember the leaders standing up telling a congregation who we were about to sing for that all of the members of the group were Christians uh, and I remember being deeply convicted in my heart that actually that was a picture that I was conveying that was something that to someone looking from the outside may have thought that was true of my life but actually I knew in my heart that I didn't have a real relationship with Jesus for myself. And it was just a few weeks after that, that uh, again, as a group, we were attending a mission in one of the the small churches on the circuit. And uh, I have absolutely no idea what the, the preacher had said, but I remember coming home and uh, kneeling at my bed and giving my life to Jesus. And that's the point uh, that I would look to as as the point when Jesus came into my heart and into my life and uh, began that work of transformation within my life. And from there, things 
I suppose, changed reasonably quickly. I got involved with helping and leading in that Christian Endeavour group, but also got involved in a group which was operating in Dungannon called Lighthouse Christian Ministries. We were involved in evangelism on the, the streets of Dungannon and Portadown and in other parts as well. And I suppose doing things that, as uh, as a young believer, really stretched me, caused me to answer some of the big questions of life, caused me to address things where I had perhaps doubts within my own faith, as I would have met other people who asked me those questions and, and pointed those uh, areas of where I didn't really have answers for. So it caused me to, to examine that and really strengthen my faith. And thankfully... As I moved on, that was something that, that's really been a foundation for me moving forward. Going on from there, I went on to university in Queen's University in Belfast, studied agriculture and came back home to farm and had certainly no intention of doing anything else for the rest of my life. I really enjoyed that life really enjoyed taking a bit more charge of the farm and my father was very gracious in allowing me the the space to go in a slightly different direction with the farm and to move more exclusively into dairy farming and again that was something I had a real passion for and a real interest in and something that seemed to be going very well. In my early 20s I then married Pamela who I had known for a good number of years and we had our first couple of children Stephen and Amy and through those years whilst I couldn't really put my finger on what it was I just knew there was something that God was prompting in my heart and even though everything would have led me to believe that this was the pathway for my life, that I was to to stay on the farm, that I was the fourth generation, that I was to continue in that way. I just knew there was something going on in my heart that God was placing a call on me to do something different. And I explored a number of different things. I thought because I had studied agriculture, that perhaps it was a call to overseas development work. I investigated some of those opportunities. None of those doors seemed to be opening. Tried lots of different uh, organisations. None of those things seemed to really be resonating either with me or opportunities opening up to do that. And so I was really getting to a point where I was quite unsettled in terms of knowing that God wanted me to do something different, but actually not knowing what that was. Welcome back to Heartlands here in Midlands 103 with me, the Reverend Nigel Gill, where I am having a conversation with the Reverend David Turtle, President of the Methodist Church here in Ireland. David has been outlining to us his journey through his childhood, growing up on a farm, having then got married to Pamela, and having decided to go and concentrate his efforts then on dairy farming himself. He also shared of his journey to faith, where he grew up in a Christian home, was very immersed in all things Christian, going to church on a Sunday morning, going to afternoon services, and then going to an evening service. But as he had been journeying along in that, he discovered he wasn't where he ought to be, and that his life indeed was hypocritical, a sham especially when someone went and announced that they were all Christians and he knew that that wasn't really true of him. And so he started to be convicted of his need to get right with God, which he did as a teenager. However, after being farming for a number of years, and welcomed a son and daughter into their lives, he was uneasy and unsure about what it was that he was supposed to do, but he believed that God wanted him to do more and yet couldn't figure out what that was. And that is where we left the story. So, David, can you please tell us what happened next? I remember Pamela saying to me, whatever it is, you better find out because you can't go on like this. Different people over the years had suggested to me that I should consider going into ordained ministry. And I think that was the point at which I said to the Lord, Lord, whatever it is, would you show me, even if it's ordained ministry? And it was the following morning 
in my Bible readings, there was Mark chapter 10 that said, I tell you the truth, no one who's left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me in the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age, homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children and fields, and with them persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. And there was just a real sense of peace and confirmation that actually this was the path that God was calling me down. And I felt this is something that's going to take a lot of time. We had a pedigree herd of dairy cows and you from experience that dispersing a herd like that was going to take a little while. And so that was the attitude I was taking. But the next morning when I was reading through the scripture passage that was in that set of readings, that was the question that was in my mind, you know, when, how long will this be? And the thing that struck me, which had never struck me before, was from Matthew chapter 4, where Jesus was calling the first disciples. And the thing that really stood out to me was uh, immediately they left their nets and they followed him. So there were, again, there was that sense that this was something that I needed to do quickly. So I started to put wheels in motion and six months after that first time of confirmation, our dairy herd was being sold and I was starting two weeks after that as a lay pastor in the Ochnafloy and Monaghan Methodist Circuit and with no theological training and no real pastoral experience and the people of that circuit put a great deal of faith and confidence in me which I'm sure was misguided but at the same time I was really blessed through that whole period with a sense of God turn up again and again in ways that I can't really explain or or put into words but actually just a real sense that God was right in the midst of all that was going on and having no real guarantee that I was going to be received as a candidate for Methodist ministry. I had sort of burned a lot of bridges uh, at that point but had the confidence that God was was leading me in that direction. So I continued to to work in a part-time capacity with the circuit in Ochnachloy and Monaghan whilst studying part-time for local preachers exams, studying then part-time for a Masters of Divinity degree and uh, all the time still waiting to see whether my application to be received as a ordained minister was going to go through. Thankfully that did and I spent four years working part-time as a lay pastor before then being stationed to Balna Hinch as uh, a minister and again with a huge amount of learning to do the the folks there in my first church were incredibly gracious and offered me a lot of grace and forgiveness for mistakes I'm sure that I made along the way and I just had a real sense that that God was at work in that place it was coming to a stage in my life where I had a number of different challenges uh, on the way through our the candidating process for ministry I had a medical which revealed I had a heart murmur and so just six months into my first station I had to have open heart surgery for heart valve repair and that was something I suppose that I hadn't really bargained for coming to the end of my time in Balna Hinch, my wife Pamela ended up with viral meningitis and was really, really poorly with that for a long number of months and in fact took about five years to really fully recover from that. And again, those were experiences where weren't things that we would have ever wanted to invite into our lives, weren't things that we would ever have looked for, but at the same time were times whenever looking back we can see were tremendously stretching for us in our faith but times when we saw God uh, in his faithfulness standing with us bringing the people into our lives who were significant uh, in seeing us through that and time and time again just seeing miraculous situations really is the only way we can 
describe them where actually we saw God's hand at work. Thank you, David. And now we will just pause for the reading of the word and we will listen to Psalm 133, which is our lectionary psalm for today. Read to us by Charlize. We're reading Psalms 133. How good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. It is like precious oil poured on the head, running down on the beard, running down on Aaron's beard, down on the collar of his robe. It is as if the dew of Hermon were falling on Mount Zion, for there the Lord bestows his blessing, even life for evermore. Welcome back to Heartlands here in Midlands 103 with me, the Reverend Nigel Gill, and my guest today is the President of the Methodist Church in Ireland, the Reverend David Turtle. David has been outlining to us his journey through his childhood, his journey of faith, his journey into farming, his journey away from farming, and how it was that God had a call on his life, but he didn't know what that was, and even to the point where his wife came to him and said you need to figure out what's going on here and so the day came when the animals were sold and he went and stepped into ministry as a lay pastor not even having any theological training at all and yet he worked his way through becoming a local preacher then going on to do his masters in theology and then going and being accepted by Edgehill Theological College and becoming a minister in the Methodist Church. Then he spoke of his stationing journeys in the circuits that he was placed on and then as he was going through the process of being seen as eligible for ministry he went for a medical which landed him in the position of discovering he needed to get open heart surgery. But that wasn't all of their woes. Added to that then, his wife Pamela ended up suffering a very severe illness, which took her five years to recuperate from. And though he says it is not something you would be wishing for or looking for, he can see God's hand in it all. However, there is a question I would like to ask him, and this has got to do with, well his wife's perspective on all of this, even though she's not here with us today, the question that poses in my mind is, what did Pamela think of the fact that her husband, who was a farmer, and that's who she married, and they were planning to live out their lives as a farming couple, suddenly became a minister in the church, and the transition that that had. Did Pamela take this new life? What was the journey really like for her? So David, if you wouldn't mind telling us, how did Pamela take this transition from, from having started life, married to the man of her dreams, a farmer, who had now changed direction completely, becoming a minister? In the church. So certainly that was a transition for I suppose all of the family and Pamela has been remarkably adaptable and flexible in terms of coping with the changes that come from moving from being in a situation where we had designed and built our own home uh, on our farm and I suppose had things the way that we anticipated that they would be for many years to come to then being very much at the mercy of the stationing committee of the, the Methodist Church which uh, decides essentially where and when we will move churches and the upheaval that comes along with that. That's something that she's been probably much better at being open to than I have. Sometimes I'm very prone to getting settled in a particular context and find it hard to see beyond that. But Pamela's been much better at adapting to that lifestyle. And actually, it was right in the midst of 
her illness whenever we received a call to move from Balnehinch and I couldn't see past how she was going to deal with that move in the condition she was in at that stage. She wasn't able to go upstairs. She wasn't able to walk any further than a few, maybe 20 or 30 yards. And uh, I couldn't see how this was going to to function in terms of a, a move. But actually she was the one who said, no, I think this is right. And it was when we moved that actually a casual conversation with someone in Lisburn translated into her receiving a programme of care, which was where her real rehabilitation actually started and where she really started to see progress. And about six months uh, on from there, we were attending Castlewell on Holiday Week and someone came to offer the opportunity to people of trekking to Everest Base Camp. And Pamela, who again at that stage was only walking a few yards, turned to me and said, I'm going to do that. And I said, yes, dear, that's great. But in 2017, six years later, Pamela reached Everest Base Camp. And that was something that was a, a real achievement for her. But again, something that reflected many years of journeying with God through the questions and the challenges and the difficulties that arise from living with chronic illness and uh, I think that's something which in both my ministry and in the way that Pamela relates to people has been something that's brought a, a sense of empathy and understanding in terms of what many people are, are dealing with in our congregations in our communities uh, and beyond. Now David, changing the lane a little bit, I would like you to go and share with me what are some of the highs and lows of your presidency as president of the Methodist Church only has a one-year tenure in that position, so it's quite short. Can you outline to us some of your highs and lows, please? So throughout this year as president, I suppose there's been remarkable privileges and opportunities to have an insight into what God's doing, not just within the Methodist Church in Ireland, even though it's been amazing to to see the breadth of that, but also in the church beyond and in other denominations in Ireland. And it's just been an amazing privilege to, to see all of that. The things that have been really in encouraging for me are the places where we discover people who with perhaps very limited resources in terms of their outward resources are actually being incredibly creative and passionate about seeing God's kingdom built in terms of seeing people brought to know Jesus in seeing people helped and assisted in their lives in difficult circumstances and people just who have a real passion for that. Some of our smaller churches are doing amazingly creative things and have taken some very difficult and courageous decisions in moving forward. And those are the things that just speak to me of the fact that God's church is always going to move forward uh, as people live for Jesus and see ways in which their faith can be worked out in his service and for the good of others. I think there have been situations within the life of our communities that have been deeply challenging, particularly I suppose in terms of the political situation in Northern Ireland. Uh, We've been through a number of difficult months and due to the position I've been in, I perhaps had closer access to talk to those who have been involved with our political parties than previously before. And that's been something that has, I suppose, enabled me to see some of the the challenges that our communities are facing at, at a closer level. People who are really struggling with the whole cost of living crisis and uh, people who are in much more difficult circumstances 
And that's something I suppose that our church has been talking about for a long time. But in circuit ministry, it's maybe something that we don't come face to face with as, as often. And through our politicians, through our city mission superintendents, through people who are dealing with people in their lives day by day facing these issues, that's something that's really been challenging to me. My guest today is the Reverend David Turkle, the President of the Methodist Church in Ireland. And I had caught up with him a few weeks ago when he was here and asked him for an interview detailing and sharing with us how God has been working and ministering and moving through his life. At this point, we come to a place where we ask for a reflection that someone would share their favourite verse of scripture or share what scripture has been impacting them of late. And so this is the very thing I am going to ask David to do. But before we do that, we will listen to the very familiar story of the feeding of the 5,000, read to us by Suchi, taken from Matthew, and chapter 14, verses 1 to 21. And indeed, that is what the President's reflection shall be upon. So, here is Suchi, reading to us from Matthew's Gospel. Matthew 14, 1 to 21. At that time, Herod the Tetrarch heard the report about Jesus and said to his servants, This is John the Baptist. He is risen from the dead, and therefore these paths at work in him. For Herod had laid hold of John and bound him, and put him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife. Because John had said to him, It is not lawful for you to have her. And although he wanted to put him to death, he feared the multitude, because they counted him as a prophet. But when Herod's birthday was celebrated, the daughter of Herodias danced before them and pleased Herod. Therefore he promised with an oath to give her whatever she might ask. So she, having been prompted by her mother, said, Give me John the Baptist's head on a platter. And the king was sorry. Nevertheless, because of the oath and because of those who sat with him, he commanded it to be given to her. So he sent and had John beheaded in prison. And his head was brought on a platter and given to the girl, and she brought it to her mother. Then his disciples came and took away the body and buried it and went and told Jesus. When Jesus heard it, he departed from there by boat to a deserted place by himself. But when the multitudes heard it, they followed him on foot from the cities. And when Jesus went out, he saw a great multitude and he was moved with compassion for them and healed their sick. When it was evening, his disciples came to him saying, this is a deserted place, and the hour is already late. Send the multitudes away, that they may go into the villages and buy themselves food. But Jesus said to them, They do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. And they said to him, We have your only five loaves and two fish. He said, Bring them here to me. Then he commanded the multitudes to sit down on the grass. And he took the five loaves and the two fish. And looking up to heaven, he blessed and broke and gave the loaves to the disciples. And the disciples gave to the multitudes. So they all ate and were filled. And they took up twelve baskets full of fragments that remained. Now those who had eaten were about five thousand men, besides women and children. David, at this point of the show, we always ask our guests for a reflection to share on their favourite passage of scripture or to share on a scripture that means something to them at late. So what words of wisdom have you got for us today, please? So one of the passages which over the years, I suppose always something which resonated strongly with me was where Jesus feeds the 5,000, particularly the account that we have of that in Matthew's Gospel. And that account comes immediately after John the Baptist has been beheaded and Jesus in many ways I think is dealing with the grief and the loss of that and working through that and as he goes on he's going and wants to go to a a quiet place but then these crowds come uh, and arrive and Jesus immediately just responds to that and goes into to ministry mode and he has compassion on them he heals those who are ill and then as evening comes the disciples approach him and they say this is a remote place it's already getting dark send the crowds away so that they can go and buy food 
And Jesus says they don't need to go away. You give them something to eat. And that's, I suppose, where the drama begins in many ways because the sun's setting, there are thousands of people, there are families, the disciples are saying, these people just followed you on the spur of the moment. They didn't come prepared to, to spend the night or to eat. And Jesus doesn't argue about any of that. Nobody's arguing about the issue that they need to eat. The question's how that's going to be dealt with. And so Jesus looks at his 12 followers and he says, you feed them, you do it. And immediately they think what all of us have maybe thought of on in some stage of life in some shape or form maybe not on this scale where we are saying i'm not arguing with the need but i can't do that i'm not capable of that i it needs to be done but i'm not capable of doing that jesus you're going to have to come up with another plan uh, they say we've only five loaves of bread and two fish and john's gospel fills in the details that a, a boy has brought those but regardless of where they've come from this is all that the disciples have at their disposal and they're saying we don't have what we need to accomplish what you've asked us to accomplish and Jesus says bring them here to me in other words give me hand over what you have there give me everything that you've got give me your full capacity and let me touch what you think is not enough to get the job done. And he asked the people to sit down on the grass. Everyone has a seat. And there's Jesus and the 12 disciples. And I imagine they're lined up in front of him and they're they're looking around thinking, what's the best way to get out of here? Because all of these hungry people are going to find out that the chip van's not coming, the ice cream van's not coming. And taking the, the loaves and the fish and looking up to heaven, Jesus gives thanks and breaks the loaves and gives them to the disciples. And it, I suppose in my mind it's trying to imagine that moment where you're facing Jesus, you've got thousands of people behind you sitting down waiting for their dinner and Jesus takes the fish and uh, I don't know whether he cuts it up or breaks it up and he breaks the bread and Jesus hands you this little piece and you ask, what am I supposed to do now? Do I turn around? What's going to happen now? And then he gave them to the disciples and the disciples gave them to the people. And the principle, I suppose, underlying that, which has come to me over the course of this year powerfully again, is this principle that throughout the history of his people, throughout the history of the church, that the disciples take what they have and they did with what they had the only thing that they could do. They hand it to Jesus and allow him to touch it. And then Jesus intervenes and does what only he can do. And something that was beyond their capability and capacity happened. I suppose the short version is they did what they knew to do and then Jesus did what only he can do. And that's something that I think we're seeing again and again replicated throughout the churches in our own connection of no doubt and churches of other denominations as well, both here in Ireland and across the world where people are taking the little that they have, the little that they can do, offering it to Jesus, and then Jesus is able to take that and do beyond what any of us could imagine that he would do, and to bring glory to him and to bring change and transformation in the lives of many people. Thank you, David. Folks, my thanks to the Reverend David Turtle, President of the Methodist Church in Ireland, for coming and sharing his story with us today and sharing on that reflection, which has really challenged me and touched my heart. At this point, all that's left for me to say is thank you very much for listening and joining with us today. And until the next time, may the Lord bless you and keep you, make his face shine upon you, show you grace, and turn his face towards you, and give you peace. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen.